Good afternoon and welcome to our service here at Online Bible Church. We are so glad that you are here and we hope that you've come expecting something from the Lord today. Now, right off the bat, I want to apologize. Um, you'll notice two weeks ago we did not have a service. It was completely unintentional. I recorded the service um, and I was trying to upload it to YouTube and I kept saying it was going to take eight hours and then 12 hours and then 24 hours just to upload a 48-minute video. And so I tried all afternoon and evening to try and get it to upload and it wouldn't work. So what happened was that service that was filmed for two weeks ago was uploaded last week. And so we do apologize and we appreciate your understanding. When you have a uh, completely internet-based church and internet-based ministry, uh, you're pretty well dependent on the internet working. And so sometimes it doesn't always work as best as we want it to. And so that can kind of, um, at the last minute, throw things off and, and really throw a wrench into our plans. But anyway, we got the video uploaded. It was just a week late. And so we appreciate your understanding with that. I mean, these things do happen and there's not much we can do about it. But anyway, we've got it figured out. The service was uploaded um, and so we appreciate your understanding with that. Please check out our YouTube channel. Uh, we finished a 10-part series of, of 10 very brief videos where we explain our articles of faith. And like any other church, Online Bible Church has articles of faith, a statement of what it believes, and we go through each one of those 10 points in the article of articles of faith. And you'll notice that what we believe is pretty well um, consistent with what other conservative King James Bible believing hymn singing churches believe. There's nothing uh, in our articles of faith that really separate us from other uh, conservative um, fundamental churches. And so we do appreciate um, you checking that out and learning about what we believe and what the church believes. And I believe that uh, that can be a blessing to really understand why do we believe what we believe and sometimes we have to go back to basics and, and really look at what we believe also i i uploaded a video the other day on should christians have christmas trees and this is something that i've i've had asked of me and i've also seen on facebook and uh, some other youtube ministries try to cover the topic and so i did my best to give what essentially was my opinion but i believe it was a bible-based opinion. There are no Christmas trees in the Bible. I'm going to tell you that right now. But um, one of the, the passages or the main passage that people who object to Christmas trees um, use, and, and we looked at that passage and I tried to explain that that's not really um, talking about Christmas trees. It's talking about idols and pagan worship. And so you'll want to check that video out. I don't believe there's anything wrong with having a Christmas tree, as long as it's not your God. So anyway, check that video out. Also, our Bible study, we're in Romans chapter 15. We're getting close to the end of the book. And um, uh, I really believe that God is, is really uh, teaching. It's, I'm learning a lot by studying the Bible verse by verse and teaching verse by verse through Romans. And so if you've been watching... Uh, we appreciate it, and we hope that it's a blessing to you as well. And so we're going to get into worshiping the Lord this afternoon, and I have a hymn picked out, and it's one that we've sung a long, long time ago. It's called An Empty Mansion, and this will tie into my message, and you'll see why uh, once we get preaching. But let's sing An Empty Mansion. If you know the words, sing along. If you don't, listen. It's a wonderful, wonderful old hymn with a lot of, of promise and a lot of encouragement in it. Here I labor and toil as I look for a home, just a humble abode among men. While in heaven a mansion is waiting for me, and a gentle voice pleading, come in. Well, there's a mansion now empty just waiting for me 
At the end of life's trouble some way, many friends and dear loved ones will welcome me there, near the door of that mansion someday. Ever thankful am I that my Savior and Lord Promised unto the weary sweet rest. Nothing more could I ask than a mansion above, there to live with the saved and the blessed. There's a mansion now and just waiting for me at the end of life's trouble some way. Many friends and dear loved ones will welcome me there near the door of that mansion someday. When my labor and toiling has ended below, and my hands shall lie folded in rest, I'll exchange this old home for a mansion up there, and invite the archangel as guest. There's a mansion now empty just waiting for me at the end of life's trouble some way. Many friends and dear loved ones will welcome me there near the door of that mansion someday. When my labor and toiling has ended below, and my hands shall lie folded in rest, I'll exchange this old home for a mansion up there, and invite the archangel as guest. There's a mansion now empty just waiting for me at the end of life's troublesome way. Many friends and dear loved ones will welcome me there near the door of that mansion someday. Well, some golden day break, Jesus will come. Some golden day break, battles are won. Well, we'll shout the victory. Break through the blue, some golden day break for me, for you. Praise the Lord. I can't wait for that day. Jesus is coming. It's a promise that we're going to look at today. And it's a promise that he's going to keep. Praise the Lord. Amen. So we're going to pray this afternoon and we're going to pray for God to be in this service. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the privilege and the opportunity that we have to be able to gather together here on Facebook Live, on YouTube, wherever this video may end up. Uh, we're so thankful that we have the use of technology when that technology works. And we know that sometimes that technology is down and doesn't quite work the way we want it to. 
But we are so thankful that people are patient, that people um, are understanding of that, Lord, and, and uh, we know that somehow your word is going to come through. We know that your truth is going to prevail. We know that your truth is going to be told, regardless of whether there's problems with technology or not. And so I just want to pray, God, that you will be in this service. I want to pray, Lord, that this message um, that I am about to preach, I pray, God, that you'll give me the anointing to be able to preach it, proclaim your truth with boldness and conviction, Lord. I want to pray, God, for people that are watching this video and participating in this service. I thank you for each one of them. And I just pray, God, that this message will speak to their hearts, Lord, and give them a little bit of an encouragement to know, Lord, that you keep your promises. And so we're going to preach and proclaim your truth today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, if you haven't figured it out yet, I'm going to preach today just for a few moments with the help of the Lord on the idea that God keeps his promises. God keeps his promises. And I know that this message is for somebody. And I know that this message might be the most important message that you'll ever hear. Because I think that there might be somebody watching today that's maybe lost a little bit of faith. Maybe they've, they've kind of struggled with the idea that God made a promise, but it hasn't come true yet. And so I want to encourage you today that God, when he gives a promise, that promise will come to pass. We're going to start out in the book of John, the Gospel of John. John, the 14th chapter, verses 1 to 3. And you'll see how this ties in with the song that we sung a few moments ago. John, the 14th chapter, verses 1 to 3. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. This is the words of our Lord Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry. And we know that a lot of what Christ preached in his earthly ministry was to Jews. But I believe that this is something that every one of us can look forward to. Let's go back to verse 1 and let's look at this a little closer. Let not your heart be troubled. Do you ever have a troubled heart? Do you ever have a little bit of an anxiety? Maybe you look around and you see the things that are going on in the world today. There's a lot of darkness, there's a lot of evil, there's a lot of corruption. There's a lot of things that are happening today that are terrible. A lot of things that are happening that, that if you're in Christ, you can really get discouraged about. I know I get discouraged sometimes when I look at the things that are going on, but the thing that keeps me going is knowing that God has given me a promise. God has given each one of us a promise. And Jesus declares it right here. Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. We know that Jesus Christ is God manifest in flesh. We know that. We know that Christ was divine. We know that Christ, uh, uh, John 1, 1 says in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word we know is Logos, which means Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Word of God. We understand that. We know that. And so we believe in God, and we also believe in Jesus. And Jesus is God. We know one in the same. In my Father's house are many mansions. Well, let me tell you something. I'm reading the King James Bible, so I get a mansion. If you're reading the NIV, I'm sorry, you're only getting a room. But I read the King James Bible. I believe in the King James Bible. And so I'm getting a mansion. Praise the Lord. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. We sung this morning or this afternoon in our, our song service, An Empty Mansion. And that song is all about this. It's all about how we're laboring, we're toiling here, we're working here on earth. 
But in heaven, there's a mansion that's already there and it's already empty and it's already waiting for us. What a promise that is. And it doesn't stop there in verse 3. And I go, this is Jesus speaking. Jesus himself is going to prepare a place for us, for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself. Where I am there, ye may be also. Will you ever stop and think about this for a moment? You know, it's hard for the human brain, the finite brain, the mortal brain, to be able to comprehend eternity. I can't do it. I have no concept of eternity. I have no concept of all of this. Because I'm in my finite body. But someday we're going to get a glorified body. And all of this stuff is going to, to come to pass. And all of this stuff is going to be revealed to us. And we're going to be able to understand it. And so here, Jesus is saying he's gone to prepare that place. He's doing that right this moment. That place is almost prepared. And what's going to happen is Jesus Christ is going to come again. I believe with my whole heart that verse 3 is talking about the promise of the rapture. I believe that with my whole heart. Now, they didn't understand the rapture then. The rapture, uh, as far as a teaching and a doctrine goes, didn't come out until God revealed it to Paul, and Paul wrote it. And the best passage of Scripture that we have to, to talk about the, the rapture is in 1 Thessalonians. And I believe that 1 Thessalonians was the second book that Paul wrote, the second epistle. I believe, not everyone believes, but I believe that Paul wrote Hebrews. And I believe that that was the first book he ever written. But we know that Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians. And so that's where the doctrine of the rapture really uh, was revealed. And so people, when they heard this, when they heard Jesus speaking, they probably didn't really understand what he was talking about. They didn't understand. What are you talking about? What, what is this mansion? What are you talking about? You're coming back. They thought he was going to come right then. We thought, they thought that Christ was going to set up his, his millennial kingdom and be, be king right then and there. They didn't realize. No, it's talking about the future. I go to prepare a place for you and I will come again and receive you unto myself. That's the rapture. That where I am, there ye may be also. Where Christ is, we're going to be with him. We're, there's going to come a day when we are going to be standing face to face with Jesus Christ. What a wonderful day. I can't wait to see that. There's a song that we sing sometimes here. It's called, What a Day That Will Be When My Jesus I Shall See. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, what a glorious day that will be. You know, that's pretty encouraging when you think about it. But the bad news. Well, not the bad news. Let's go to 2 Peter. Let's go to the book of 2 Peter. Second Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continued as they were from the beginning of the creation. Knowing this first in the last days, do you believe that we're in the last days? I believe we're in the last days. We're living in what is called a post-Christian society. We're living in an increasingly secular society. We're living in an increasingly evil society. And if you don't believe me, look back a couple of weeks ago at the message I preached on the seven steps to hell. And you will see the slow progression, the steady progression, the circling the drain, if you will, of society today. And I believe that we are very much in the last days. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. What's a scoffer? Somebody that scoffs. Somebody that raises doubt. Somebody that doesn't believe. And I'm going to tell you something. Not only does the world not believe, but I, I'm discouraged to see that there's a lot of Christians, people that call themselves Christians, that no longer believe. 
There's a lot of Christians that no longer believe in the rapture. There's a lot of Christians that have switched to a, a, a post-tribulation rapture. And I don't understand that. Does that mean they go up and come right back down? No, because we're coming back with Christ in Armageddon. So if it happens at the end of the tribulation period, we're going to go up, do a U-turn, come right back down. That doesn't make any sense. There's all kinds of reasons why the rapture must be before the tribulation. We're not going to get into them today. We've looked at some of them before, and we're probably going to look at them again. But there's a lot of, of Christian people that don't believe in the rapture anymore. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Who are we going to believe? Are we going to believe the words of Christ when he says that he's gone to repair a place and he's going to come again and receive us unto himself? Are we going to believe that or are we going to believe the scoffers and say, hey, where is the promise of his coming? He hasn't here. He's not here yet. He hasn't come yet. It's been 2,000 years and he still isn't here. Maybe he's not coming. Maybe he forgot. Maybe he fell asleep. I don't know. But I'm going to tell you something today, and I'm going to encourage you today by letting you know that God keeps his promise. God promised he's going to come back. Jesus promised he's going to come back, and he's going to receive us unto himself. He's going to pull us up in the rapture. We're going to be caught up, and we're going to see him face to face. Now, I'm going to believe the words of Christ more than I'm going to believe the scoffers in the last days. Amen? Amen. Well, does God keep his promise? Well, we're going to look today briefly. We've got a few scriptures we're going to look at. We're going to look at a promise that God gave a certain group of people. And that promise took a long time to come to pass. Let's go back to Genesis. We're going to go right back to the beginning. Genesis chapter 12. Genesis 12. Oh, i got things falling out here. Genesis 12 and verse 7. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed I will give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Well, wait a second. What is this saying? And the Lord appeared unto Abram. Now, if you don't know Abram, you know that Abram later on becomes Abraham. And Abraham... He was, the first 90 years, 100 years of his life, he had no children. But God promised Abraham a seed. And when Abraham was 100 years old, that promise came to pass. He had Isaac. Now how can he promise Abraham a seed if Abraham didn't have any children? God gave him a son, Isaac. But look at what this is saying. Unto thy seed, I will give this land. What's he talking about? The land of Israel. You know, they say that Abraham is the father of many nations. God is sometimes referred to in the Old Testament as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we know that Jacob became Israel. And Jacob was the father of Israel. And so this verse says, unto thy seed, unto your, unto your uh, uh, seed, your, your offspring, your lineage, your descendants, unto your descendants, I will give this land. He's talking about Israel. Now let's go to Genesis chapter 15. Should only have to turn a couple of pages. Genesis chapter 15, verse 18. Genesis 15, verse 18. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant. What's a covenant? Well, a covenant is kind of like a contract, a promise. God gave a promise to Abram, saying, Unto thy seed I have given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, unto the river Euphrates. So here's a chunk of land that was, that was uh, promised to the descendants of Abram, or Abraham. Now let's go to Jeremiah chapter 30. We're getting a bit of a history lesson today. Jeremiah chapter 30. 
verses 1 to 3. Jeremiah 30, verses 1 to 3. The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. I'm glad he did it, and we have the book of Jeremiah. For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. You see, the Jews were in exile. The Jews have been in exile since about 800 B.C. But what happened in 1948, this promise that was written thousands of years ago came to pass in 1948 after about 1,700 years, a little more than 1,700 years, Israel became a nation again. And this was a major fulfillment of prophecy. Of prophecy. What was that? That was God keeping his promise. God promised that land to the descendants of Abraham. And here again, in Jeremiah, he's saying, God's going to bring these people back and they're going to possess that land. Well, I'm going to tell you something. It took 1,700 years, but God kept his promise. You got to think for a little while. When God makes a promise, it's going to happen. Now, it didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen in the, in the time that they thought it was going to happen. It took a long time, but I'm going to tell you something today. When God makes a promise, he's going to keep it. When God promised the land to the children of Abraham, and they were in exile, they didn't own it, they didn't occupy it, they were scattered abroad, they were all over the place, and God said, I'm going to bring these people back. And what happened? God brought them back, and in 1948, Israel became a nation again. How do we know the Bible is true? Because of the fulfilled prophecy. Let me tell you something. This is something that only Christianity can claim. I'm going to tell you something. Uh, if you look at the Quran, you're not going to see any fulfilled prophecy. You're going to see one book that was written by one man over about 40 years. But I'm going to tell you something. When you look at the Word of God, the Bible, the King James Bible, you will see that it was written by about 40 different authors over the span of about 1,600 years. And that Word is one complete story that flawlessly fits together. Christianity and the Bible can claim fulfilled prophecies. They made, God made a promise to Abraham. He promised them a seed and he promised them land. And guess what? Both of those things came to pass. So if you're sitting in your life today and you're feeling a little discouraged because God feels like he hasn't kept his promise, God's given you a promise and he hasn't uh, fulfilled it yet, let me tell you something. Don't give up hope. Don't give up don't give up because I'm going to tell you something. That promise is going to come to pass. I should. I know I can't hear you say amen, but I know somebody just said amen. Praise the Lord. Let me tell you something. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I had a whole bunch of other scriptures written out here that I was going to read, but we're not going to do that. You got the gist of it. You understood that God promised something. And it took a long time, but it came to pass. And I'm going to tell you something from my life. I got saved when I was 14 or 15 years old. I believe it was 15. It was right after my grandfather died. And that was 2002. So I would have been 15 years old at the time, yes. And I got saved. Went to the altar prayed, heard the gospel, believed it. The blood washed all of my sins away. Now I didn't, I walked away from the Lord after that, a few years later. And I walked away from the Lord for a long time. I'm going to tell you, I had a preacher, a pastor tell me one time that 
I was going to be a pastor. I was going to be a preacher. I was going to do things for God. And I'm going to tell you something. About 10 years after that pastor told me, I was living in sin. I was living as far away from God as I possibly could. And here I am today. Yes, I walked away from God for a number of years, but you know what? God made a promise. God had a calling upon my life. He promised me something. And guess what? That promise is true today. I never would have thought when I was 25 to 30 years old that I was going to be ever a preacher. But I'm standing before you almost 35 years old, and I have seen that promise come to pass. Let me tell you something. God made a promise to you. God is going to come back. Yes, this world is getting dark. Yes, this world is getting evil. This world's getting wicked. But he promised, Jesus Christ promised that he was going to return. He's going to pull us out. We're going to be caught up in the clouds. And we're going to be pulled out before it's too bad and before the tribulation happens. And I'm clinging to that promise because I know that that promise that God said was going to happen is going to happen. Praise the Lord. I'm not going to listen to the scoffers in the last days that say, ha, ah, where is the promise of his coming? It hasn't happened yet. Well, let me tell you something. It hasn't happened yet, but it's going to happen. It might take 2,000 years. Let me tell you something. Jesus Christ died about A.D. 29. And here we are in A.D. 2021. I don't think if God is on a 2,000-year uh, church timeline and a 7,000 year timeline of history and I believe he very well is that rapture is coming pretty soon in fact if Jesus Christ died in AD 29 that means 2,000 years will be AD 2029 now if you take the seven years off for the tribulation you get A.D. 2022. Let me ask you a question. What year are we about to go into? 2022. Now, I'm not saying the rapture is definitively going to happen in, in 2022, but I'm going to tell you something. If God is on this timeline, and I believe that he might be, he very well could be, I believe that the rapture is coming very, 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 very soon. And all of those scoffers have said, ha, he's not going to come. You're crazy talking about a rapture. You're crazy talking about all that kind of stuff. Even the church people that have rejected it, they no longer believe in the rapture. They no longer believe in the catching away. They no longer believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in that kind of stuff anymore. They've been scoffing. And I'm going to tell you something. When Jesus Christ returns, it's going to be a glorious thing because we're going to be caught away. It's not going to be a silent little catching away. It's going to be a glorious thing. Let me tell you something. When Jesus Christ resurrected, he was seen by many people. He was seen by many, many people. There were eyewitnesses to that happening. And I'm going to tell you something. When the rapture happens and the millions of saved Christians are caught up and the dead people are coming up out of their grave and the dead in Christ will rise first and we see them rise up to the clouds let me ask you a question how can you not believe after that happens there's going to be a lot of people that are going to willingly go into the tribulation and worship the image of the antichrist you know in in uh, psalm 14 where it says the fool has said in his heart there is no god let me tell you something. If you don't believe in the promise of His coming and you don't believe in the promise that He gave and that promise that He said is going to happen, if you don't believe in that, I'm telling you today, you're a fool. You're a fool. You might be in a place in your life right now where you're feeling far away from the promise. You might feel in your life right now where is the promise of His coming. God has promised me things, and it hasn't happened. Let me tell you something. Don't lose faith. Don't lose hope, because I'm going to tell you something. When God promises something, he will keep his promise. If you learn nothing from me, learn that. Have faith, because God keeps his promises. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful once again for the privilege and the opportunity that we have to be able to get together on the internet here and have church. What a wonderful thing. I couldn't hear the amens through my phone, but I know there were people saying amen. I know that this message was something that we needed to hear. There's a lot of anxiety today. There's a lot of, of, of despondency and a lot of discouragement today with everything that's going on. But I know, Lord, that you gave us a promise. And I know, Lord, that you will keep your promise. Hallelujah. I just want to pray, God, that you'll be with us this week as we go about our week, Lord, and get ready for Christmas. I want to pray, God, that you'll be with each one of us, Lord, that you'll bring back to our remembrance how you keep your promise. Whenever we're in a place where we're low in our lives, whenever we're in a time where we feel so distant and far from you and we lose sight of the promise, I pray, God, that you will bring back to our remembrance the fact that you gave a promise and that promise will come to pass. We pray all of these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I really hope that this message today spoke to you. And I really hope that if you're in a place in your life where you're feeling like you've lost sight of that promise, I just hope that this gave you a little bit of a nudge and maybe a little bit of a kick in the pants to remember God keeps his promises. So I hope you have a good week. Remember Bible study We're in Romans chapter 15. Don't forget, check out our YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. If you haven't liked or followed or, uh, or commented, please do so. I get a lot of encouraging comments on the, on the YouTube videos, and I'm really thankful for that. So please like, comment, and subscribe. And so until next time, God bless.